people. And this was one of my very favorite cities, so whenever I heard that the conference was in Jaipur, I immediately said yes. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. I appreciate SKU News, ECA, and of course uh, Dr. Spotty Botts for, in, for inviting me. So my talk today is going to be focused on these areas. The importance of early language and early reading skills, and then I want to go over scientific principles that are universal. They can be used in India, can be used with whatever language you're speaking, just like they can be used in China, and they're currently being used in many other countries at the same time. And then how, how you can use this approach to help uh, try to eliminate some of the poverty, try to dramatically improve education scores. As you will see from the data I'm about to present, the early years of language learning are the basis of everything else that the child is going to be able to do, along with uh, the last speaker who did a fantastic job showing you know, the attitude uh, matters also. There are many hundreds of studies that show that the child's early language environment has long-lasting effects on later language skills as well as later reading abilities. A very consistent finding in early, uh, early development is that earlier is better for language learning. So the earlier the child learns language skills, the better. You can't go back and redo any of what I'm about to be talking about. So you need to do this the first time uh, to help the child the most. So earlier is better when learning syntax, grammar, speech production, sentence processing skills, non-native languages, sign languages, and also written languages. So earlier is better. Babies who have been taught more words by 18 months of age have a greater vocabulary at age three. Children who have a greater vocabulary at age three have a greater vocabulary at age 11. So earlier is better. There's already a gap by 18 months of age with babies who understand many words and babies who understand a small number of words. This gap does not go away. So try to help uh, the children who, who need the help the most in those early months. 18-month-old babies who are in better language environments not only have greater vocabularies, they think at a faster speed. So babies who are taught to understand more words actually think faster. This is called a brain processing speed gap, and this gap also does not go away. So some people think faster. It can go all the way back to those first 18 months of life and whether or not uh, people were taught more words. There's a new study in Finland that found that language scores at age two predict PISA scores at age 15 better than early, early uh, alphabet scores or other kinds of, of scores. So the language scores by age two have a long lasting impact on academic success, communication skills, uh, even happiness, you'll see uh, every area of life is better if you have better language skills. Uh, there are also very long-term consequences for, for positive or negative reading abilities. So if you read well, you likely have better health, better education, a higher socioeconomic status, more creativity, and more intelligence. And if you don't read as well, then all of these go towards the negative side. So helping children learn to read early is also critically important. Uh, unfortunately, there are very negative consequences for children who cannot read at grade level by the end of first grade. If a child can't read at grade level by the end of first grade, fewer than one out of eight ever catch up to read at grade level again. Even if we spend billions of uh, rupee or billions of dollars or billions of any currency, you can't go back and fix these problems very easily. It's much easier to prevent the problem than to fix these problems. So the early abilities have lasting effects. Worldwide, reading scores have remained relatively flat for decades. In some countries, 
uh, if, for instance, in the UK, the, uh, the 18 year olds and 15 year olds have lower reading scores than their parents did decades ago. So even if a country has a lot of money, that doesn't mean that they have no problems with reading scores. There are problems with reading scores worldwide, mostly because of the way it's currently being taught. So there was a meta-analysis of six longitudinal studies on the topic, and uh, the best predictor of academic success at the end of high school was how well was the child doing on the very first day of school. The very first day of school, so what the preschool teachers and the parents uh, combined have helped the child learn will predict the academic success of the child at the end of high school. And the two most important skills, according to all of these meta-analyses combined, were early reading and early math skills. There are numerous studies that show uh, that early language learning predicts later reading. So there is a reciprocal effect between reading and language. We have known about this for quite a while, but uh, I will present some new data that shows it's even stronger than, than what people realized. So for decades we've known that early language scores, the better the child's language scores, the likely the better they will read later on. We've also known that readers learn new vocabulary, so the better someone reads, then the greater their vocabulary later. So there's new research that shows that if you teach babies to read words, then their language scores are a full socioeconomic status, uh, or full standard deviation above a same socioeconomic status uh, group. So teaching babies uh, to read words, which you will see why in a few minutes as I present some, some data on this, that helps the baby's language scores. So I have come up with some scientific principles of how to help babies learn language skills from reading thousands of studies and doing work in this area for, for many decades. So these principles can be applied universally. And whether the child uh, may in the future have autism, I recommend that the parents uh, use these principles because you want to help develop the child's communication skills as early as possible. Whether the child uh, you know, is, is in uh, India or the US or Australia or any country in the world, they need early language skills. So it doesn't matter what the baby is doing, this is a key part. A lot of people think what I'm about to say, it's all science so it must be somehow intense for the baby. I'm talking about babies playing children playing, they can be playing inside or outside, but while they are playing, people are applying these scientific principles to help them learn language skills. So this is not in any way intense, it's just playing with the baby following these principles that I'm about to present. Uh, and again, uh, I have data showing that if you follow these principles, it can improve the child's overall language scores, receptive language scores, which is understanding language, expressive or talking, as well as reading scores, and also overall cognition by a, uh, a standard deviation, which is an extremely large amount, because it wasn't going from at-risk babies to average. This was going from average to a full standard deviation above average. If you do this kind of approach with at-risk children, the, the results are typically larger, not smaller. Um, so, here are, uh, uh, we also have uh, had a project in, in India, and uh, we are teaching children English in environments where they had very little English at all. So we have a lot of data, and we want more and more data. The more uh, preschools that want to collect data using this, the better. Okay, so here are the principles. The first one and, and you will have heard of a few of these. Some of these likely may be new to you. So there is obviously a window of opportunity for learning language. I want to show you how you can maximize that better. The clarity of language is important and so on. To save time, I'll just jump right to them. So for the window of opportunity, 
for learning language. That's generally defined as a period of time where it's easier to learn at a high level. It doesn't mean you can't learn language skills after this time. It's just much more difficult to learn at a high level and nearly impossible in, in many of the cases to learn at the same level as if you had learned as a baby. So uh, many, it depends on the type of language, but it's generally thought of to be up until about age four. It does depend on the type of language skill as far as the window. Uh, currently, this window is not being used very well in most places in the world. There's data uh, showing parents don't talk enough to the baby, they don't follow these principles, the parents are unaware of many of the things that I'm about to say. So children are learning language skills, but not nearly as well as they could. So for instance, the number of new brain connections peaks just before 11 months of age related to language learning. So this is birth at zero, and then just before 11 months of age, the number of new language connections has peaked. So in that, the first year of life, the child already has so many brain connections related to how the child will learn that it's forming a foundation for the, uh, for the person's entire brain development. So it's very important to, to try to follow these principles during that time. There's research showing that some syntax of the first language must be acquired in the first 12 months of life, and babies who do not learn during this window later show severe impairments with syntax. So I'm not just saying, oh, they need to learn syntax. If they don't learn it in the first year, they are not going to learn it as well. And, and you can just put a period at that, unfortunately. There's a lot of data from babies in orphanages, when they were adopted and so on, and um, unfortunately we have negative data on, on this as well as positive. So infants and toddlers have thousands of new brain connections every second. So I value baby's time at a very high level. I valued my baby's time at a level higher than my own time. Babies are only going to go through this period of rapid brain development one time, and it happens very quickly. So by age two, about 75% of the mass of the brain is formed, and by age five, about 90% of the brain is developed, and then we send the children off to school. So there are also very positive effects of learning to read on overall cognition, and this has a huge potential to have uh, great positive impact in the child's life. So if you teach a child to read earlier, then uh, the positive benefits can be nearly limitless. Okay, I'm going to say a word, and then I'm going to do an action. Imagine you're a baby, and you don't know any words. What do I mean if I say Tessa? What did I mean? You don't know what I meant, really. There's so many options. I could have meant the action of drinking. I could have meant the tea. I could have meant uh, part of the cup. I could have meant the entire cup. It could have been me. It could have been the microphone. It could have been the stage. It could be all sorts of different things. So babies don't know what we are saying most of the time. There's research on this topic. I'm not just saying this. They had people watching parents talking to the babies, and they uh, turned the volume down of what the parents were saying, and the adults were trying to figure out what were the parents talking about to their babies. Most of the time, they had no idea what they were saying. So the baby takes many thousands of times of hearing people do things because parents and teachers are not being as clear. So. You want to have clarity with what you're doing. So uh, the clarity of the language input predicts the child's vocabulary three, three years later. So just by being more clear, the children will learn words at a much faster speed and they will have greater vocabularies. Okay, there's something called frequency effects. Frequency effects, that's just a, a scientific way of saying more language is better. So the more frequently uh, children hear words, the better. 
their frequency effects, there's actually a paper called Frequency Effects Are Ubiquitous. So they're literally everywhere. More is better. More is better for individual words, for syntax, for second languages, sign language, whatever it is, uh, you need more language. So that's why you hear a lot about saying 30,000 words a day, which is basically saying three words every two seconds, 12 hours a day if the baby's awake for 12 hours. So basically that's talking nonstop to the baby. Obviously people are not doing this, and then this is causing uh, the children to not do well basically for their entire lives related to language, reading, everything else, because they did not get uh, enough words in the first couple of years of life, so then they even think at a slower speed. Okay, there's also research showing that if you isolate a word, then use it in a sentence, the person's more likely to understand what you're saying. So this is really easy uh, if you hear a second uh, word in a second language. So whenever I said um, Tasa, that's actually a German word for cup. And so if I just say the word, you're not likely to remember it uh, you know, all that well uh, in a sentence. But if I say it individually, then use it in a sentence, you have a better chance of remembering it. So. Children learn both syntax and the individual words if you use this approach. So say the word, then use that word in a sentence, and while you're saying the word, point out whatever it is. So if you say microphone, this is a microphone. The microphone makes my voice louder, or something like that. So uh, the number of times the word is used in isolation predicts whether or not the child will want to say the word or be comfortable using the word, not the total number of times the child has heard the word. So you need to hear words in isolation to be more comfortable for saying them. Now this one sounds very scientific, but if you just think about what I'm saying, it's not, not that bad. Intersensory redundancy, okay? So what that means is you're getting the same information in, through more than one sensory system and it's redundant. So if I say a word and you can see the word, so if I say the word ear, at the same time you see the word ear, then you're getting intersensory redundant information. There's research showing that babies learn more when they get this type of information. So obviously I would do something like this, and this will also do the principle before about saying the word in isolation and using it in a sentence. Ear, ear, this is a picture of an ear. You hear with your ear, this is my ear, this is your ear, ear. So if you do something like that, the child will learn the word ear and hear it in a sentence and a little bit about the meaning of what, what the word ear means. Okay, so even two day old babies actually uh, learn a totally arbitrary audio video relationship and they can learn this quickly so a lot of people think well how does the baby know what you're saying or what they see if you do it over and over there's actually a pattern to the written language just like there's a pattern to the spoken language so the babies learn the patterns of uh, what goes with what one trial of intersensory redundant information assists babies uh, when they are figuring out two different objects they can discriminate amongst, among objects better if you give them multi-sensory information instead of just through one sensory system. So with everything else, with playing, everyone talks about babies should have multi-sensory information, but we have a long tradition of learning language by the ear. You hear this all the time, learn language by the ear. But you can also learn language with your eyes. And babies need this multi-sensory and intersensory redundant information more than we do as adults because of their way the brains develop, which if I had more time, I would talk about that part more. But uh, there's a theory of brain development related to uh, how elaborate the connections are in the brain that says the more sensory systems that are involved with whatever it is you're teaching, then the more connections the child has to retrieve that information later. So you want to use multi-sensory information as much as you can. Okay, uh, everyone talks about being interactive. Of course, you want to be interactive with 
uh, with babies. There's something called parent responsiveness, which is extremely important. And what it basically means is that you have some prompt response that's contingent on whatever the baby is doing. So if the baby uh, smiles, then you respond and say, smiling, smiling. You are smiling and then you smile. So whatever you're doing is directly related to whatever the baby just did. It's very important that it's matched in time as much as possible. This is very difficult in a nursery class, you know, with many babies. So you have to be with full of energy and going around quickly responding to every baby as much as you can. It is draining. I've, I've always said I used to be a professor and uh, I always thought the preschool teachers should be getting paid at least as much as the professors because it, 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 to do the job properly, it is exhausting, exhausting. Um, so there is a lot of research now on the number of conversations and the depth of the conversations. A lot of this research is just in the last two years um, that these conversations end up predicting how much the baby will know later. So even very young babies, you can have conversations with them by repeating back any sound they make. And what they're learning are conversational terms. When we have a conversation with most people, not all people, but most people, you talk back and forth and you go back and forth. There's a little gap in time and then the other person talks. Well, the babies are learning this right from the beginning. And also, if you're repeating the same sounds back, then they can get happy and excited and be more likely to make those same sounds. So the conversations don't start off being critically important, but they become more and more and more important. So by 18 months of age, they become very important. So you need to have conversations with babies from 18 to 24 months especially. So uh, the number and quality of the conversations becomes very important around 18 months of age. And then these conversational turns predict uh, language scores 10 years later. So there's also research uh, showing that if the dads ask uh, who, where, what, why type questions to the babies, that many years later, those children do better. Uh, so the more interactions you get and not uh, close questions, a lot of open questions to the baby, the better. Okay. Now, I, I'm only mentioning this one because you hear a lot about how everything needs to be concrete for babies and toddlers. That is not true. Most things should be concrete properly, but not everything. There's research showing that the proportion of decontextualized talk, in other words, you're talking about things that are not right here. You're talking about things that happened previously, things that are going to happen, things that are happening over there that they can't see. It's, it's sort of abstract. That that kind of talk at 30 months of age predicts academic skills at age 12 more than the child's vocabulary, socioeconomic status, or other factors. So you do want some things that are abstract also. Uh, we talked about metacognition, or the other professors were talking about metacognition yesterday. This is related to that. A lot of what I'm talking about is related to what we heard yesterday. Okay, so babies naturally figure out patterns of language. Infants not only can learn fairly complex patterns of syntax early in life, they need to learn them in the first year of life or they show problems later. So babies figure out things such as when to add an S onto words to make them plural or when to add an ED onto words to make them past tense. Oh my God, I, I just got the five minutes. I can't believe I've been up here 25 minutes. I don't believe that's true. I, I don't think that's true. I, I don't want to stop yet. I have too much information. Um, I, this is one of the most important concepts. It's called the shape bias, and I'm going to have to skip it. Uh, don't sort by color, um, sort by shape. I, I don't think that that time is right. I'm sorry to complain, but I, do I have a little bit more time? Have I been here 25 minutes? <laughs> well, all right, I have to skip some of these. Use more variability when you're teaching categories have many different people talking, saying the same words in different moods even, that helps the children learn the words. You want to increase the diversity of the language over time. Uh, teach multiple languages simultaneously instead of consecutively, and the child's brain actually develops more efficiently. 
than if you did it consecutively. Uh, in the first year of life, the return on investment and how much time and energy you put in the baby is more than 10 to one. At age five, it's around one to one. So if societies want to invest in babies, they will get a greater return for how much effort they put in. Okay, I'm going to jump to a video. Okay, so th this is showing a series of babies, a series of babies who are reading words, but many of them also learned phonics by, by this age. Good job. Okay, so I'm going to show you the This is my own daughter, Alika, at nine months. So she sees the word head, she touches her head. Sorry, the audio is not on right now, but um, I'm not saying the word until after she does this. She sees the word pointing, and she's like, that's me a uh, few years ago. Okay. Yeah, this was in 1991. Uh, she sees the word teeth and touches her teeth. Um, she actually could read about 400 words at 12 months of age. And um, so her early language skills developed at a rate that are not anywhere close to typical, but it shows what is possible if you follow this approach. Of course, I was following this approach over 20 years ago with, with both of my own daughters. And now we have had millions of people use this approach. And we are also in India. Uh, we have just gotten into India in preschool, so if you're interested in finding out more, there's a stand about it. Uh, it says laugh. You can see that she's laughing. I'm sorry that we couldn't hear it. Notice how she's changing her voice. This baby's first language was Farsi, but she's reading the words in English. We have many more babies. But from the very, very beginning, um, has saw this just like show a this. I'm, sorry. I'm trying and to stop it. But, um, if you can show the other video for a few seconds, you'll see it's a very simple approach. Thank you. A uh, very simple approach where uh, the babies see the words, wow. hear the words, see and hear what they mean. Wow. The baby is clapping. Can you clap? Say nose. Nose. Touch your nose just like Graham. Arms. Okay, I think that's Arms. it. So we have this in, in nine languages right now. And I made this for my own babies because I actually am one of the most anti television people you will ever find for babies and toddlers. And I didn't want my own children to watch Sesame Street or any of the shows that were available. Uh, I made one that was very interactive, multi-sensory, and followed the scientific principles for language learning. My children grew up not even knowing how or having an interest in turning on the TV. So I made turning on the TV very complicated. If you turned it on, you'd see a blue screen and nothing else. I was a parent trying to make it difficult for them to turn on the TV, but they had no interest until about middle school. By then, it didn't matter quite as much as early on. So anyway, I don't want you to think that, oh, I just want babies watching TV all the time. I actually don't want them watching TV. 
except if the parent's busy for a few minutes here or there or is attending to another child. And we have uh, many other kinds of products that help them learn language skills. All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, oh, can I? oh thank you, thank you. So I can talk about the shape bias. There are many concepts that I want to go into more detail on and I'll stay as long until I'm pushed off. Um, so, so the shape bias means, um, it, it's defined as a tendency to categorize objects by their shapes instead of their color, texture, size, or some other material. So remember earlier, I talked about how um, I held up a little cup, which unfortunately they took away, but uh, so I have a bottle. So if I say bottle and the child eventually figures out this is a bottle, then the child sees another bottle, the child won't necessarily know that's a bottle. You have to learn to generalize. So whenever I say and the child figures out this is a bottle, the child may think it's because it's transparent that it's a bottle or because it has some liquid in it, the, the color, uh, the size of it, it could be all these factors. So it's hard for children to generalize from one word to another. So what they have to figure out is that for most nouns, it's the shape of the uh, object that determines which category it's in. So parents and a lot of teachers sort things by color, which is highlighting a color bias. I see many things that are pink here. I saw this sign that told me how much time I had in pink. Normally I like pink being in the pink city, but that one I didn't like as much. But anyway, so you see many things that are pink. They don't necessarily go together. They're just because something's blue doesn't mean it goes together. But the shape of this, you can tell this is a bottle from the shape. It wouldn't matter what color it is. It could be a large bottle, it could be a very small bottle you know from the shape. So what you want to do is teach babies that the shapes of objects are why words are in uh, certain categories, okay? So what I recommend doing is not sorting by color very often. Sort mostly by shape until they have a strong shape bias. There's research showing you can teach a 17-month-old baby the shape bias in one hour one hour in a laboratory setting, then the child goes home and comes back. Other babies were taught something else at the same age, not the shape bias. They go home and come back. And then these children then have learned many more new words than the other children who were not taught the shape bias. So this has a real world implication of improving the child's vocabulary, just like all the other principles that I was talking about. So. This one I just really want to mention uh, very briefly. If you are teaching a category, uh, if you're teaching a word, you're really teaching a category of word. So if I say the word chair, um, most of the chairs here are covered up with the white sheet. You can't really see them that much. It would be better to have many different kinds of chairs, little chairs, big chairs, chairs made out of metal, chairs made out of glass, wood, and so on, slightly different shapes but there'd be a generalizable shape. And the more variability you have when you are initially teaching the category, then the better the child generalizes to other objects of the same, within the same category. So there's a, a study here that showed that um, all the children learn the exemplars, which would be the specific things that were being taught, but the ones with higher variability could generalize much, much better. So you want to have variability to help children generalize words. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, with this one, this is talking about the sounds of words. So for instance, men and women typically have different uh, ways of talking, generally, this is just a generalization, generally men speak with a lower voice, generally women speak with a higher pitch voice and so on, and other slight variations in sound. For the baby to understand and, and generalize words, it's better if babies hear men, women, boys and girls. Also, if you use a happier voice versus a more monotone voice, it actually interferes with whether or not the baby understands the word. So you actually want to use both 
so that the child can understand words, no matter who is saying them, uh, the child can understand better if they have a wide variety of different sounds that they're hearing. The same is true with the written language. So we use many different fonts, different background colors, uh, different font colors. We vary everything in a very systematic way so that the child learns to read the words faster as well as what the words mean faster because we generalize. For instance, we have the word clap. And for the word clap, we don't just have babies clapping because the baby won't know when you say the word clap, does the word clap mean baby? The babies don't know. So we have a gorilla clapping. We have all sorts of things happening. Thank you very much. Thank you.